Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction, which always makes you sound like this really important person. I mean, it happens every time, and then you think, can I live up to it? Um, I also, having the last keynote, have to live up to some absolutely wonderful keynotes from um, my colleagues and also some really great panel papers. Um, so thank you, the survivors, for being here. Um, this is what's known as the graveyard shift, and I had originally thought I would talk about the immunopolitics of death, um, and now I wish maybe I had. That would have been very, very appropriate. Okay, um, so what I am going to do is um, immunopolitics and chemerism. Um, and my presentation is going to bring together some aspects of biomedicine, and particularly the discourse of immunology with the biopolitical and philosophical understanding of immunity, which in recent years has become a very hot topic, as you'll know. The cross-articulation of political, philosophical, and biological thought is nothing new. But to give the inquiry some substantive ground, I will look initially at the general issue of the immunological paradigm through the operation of chemerism, microchemerism, in the context of biomedicine. Now, of course, biomedicine is still very, very far from um, recognizing posthumanism. So my intervention is looking for the cracks um, through which we can, um, in some sense, seize on the more expansive implications of what's happening in biomedicine. Now, strangely, although human-focused um, microchemerism, and I'll, I'll explain these terms in a minute, um, appears as a rent in biomedicine, the concept is already very well established as a probable evolutionary phenomena that has been detected in plants and in vertebrates, as well as many vertebrates in mammals, such as monkeys, rodents, pigs, cattle, and dogs. And as such, it already challenges the conventional evolutionary discourse of the dominance of genetic homogeneity in biology. And I'm going to do no more than signpost it here, but it, it, you should note also that chemerism is equally disruptive of the teleology that might be supposed to underlie evolution. So for this presentation, I'm specifically referencing microchemerism and chemerism in heart transplantation, which is one of my areas of research, where the question of what constitutes the human is slowly but surely coming to the surface. And it's not yet a post-human moment, but certainly opens up the human otherwise as rich in possibilities. Now, where my phenomenologically based research already shows that heart transplantation unsettles identity to the self and signals new ways of becoming other, chemerism and microchemerism present a challenge from within bioscience to one of the fundamental doxas of Western medicine, namely the discourse of the self's immunity to the other. That, and that's the justification, if you like, the, the, the thing that sustains the Western obsession with the distinction between one body and the other, as well as obviously supporting species barriers. Now, in response to that challenge, new thinking is emerging that rather than seeing the breakdown of immunity as signaling the onset of pathology, it engages with a growing understanding that microchemerism is a universal and potentially beneficial occurrence. Nonetheless, both the authorized discourse of the clinic and the sociocultural imaginary continue to insist on clear boundaries between the self and other, assuring heart recipients, for example, of their continuing essential singularity. Now, in theorizing what's at stake, I hope to suggest another way forward. In other words, a post-humanist biopolitics that encompasses multiple transcorporeal, transgenerational, and ultimately trans-species embodiments. And far from focusing on surface expression, I want to, be, want to go even beyond visceral phenomenology to excavate significance at the cellular level. So I'm going to start by running through some of the um, powerful and conventional um, biomedical material. And paramount is the appeal to the putatively unique and temporarily stable genetic signature of each human cell, which in turn determines the precise makeup of what's called the human leukocyte antigen. This is the HLA system that underpins our immunological um, 
uh, embo sorry, that un under underpins um, our embodiment. Now, all the cells of the body, and I'm, I'm going to do little bits of science that you probably are unfamiliar with, um, and I'm not going to give the references because, you know, science papers have at least ten authors. Okay, so all the cells of the body incorporate the human leukocyte antigens that mark them as self. And when the immune system encounters cells without those precise combinations, um, as for example in bacterial or um, viral infections, tumours or transplants, it identifies them as not self. And it launches an immune response that treats the unrecognised material as pathogens to be neutralised. Now, it's extremely rare, um, almost unknown, I think, to have two individuals with the same gene-encoded set of HLA um, molecules, and that's what's collectively called the tissue type. And as a result, we consider that the biological distinction between self and non-self, whether it's human or animal, is absolute and embodied. So in lay terms, and indeed in many of the current student textbooks, I mean, if you've got one from you know, last year, it would still say this, Immunology itself is described as a science of self-non-self discrimination. In reality, the purity of that distinction is illusory. And what constitutes the proper me is already shot through with otherness. So we already know that human bodies are swarming with a multitude of putatively alien others, such as the countless bacteria that inhabit our gut, um, while current research on the microbiome, which is actually the biggest funded research in the States at the moment into the microbiome, where it was going into um, the um, genetic research, it's now into the microbiome. So you can guess it's got military purposes behind it. Um, that research is indicating that microbial communities that cohabit in and on our bodies immeasurably exceed the strictly human cell components. Now, as you might guess, um, this is, this is an area where there is a lot going on, but it's not yet being very publicly talked about. So we are at very least super organisms that are deeply hybrid in nature and display none of the expected distinctions that mark out self from other. And I should say um, I'm using the metaphor of hybridity in its cultural sense. Um, biological hybridity is something different, but I'm using it in the cultural sense. Okay, so in drawing on my own prior phenomenological research around the culturally perceived hybridity of organ transplantation, where the distinction between self and other is radically compromised, I want to look more specifically at the event and implications of cellular chemerism in relation to the discourse of the self's immunity to the other. Now, the word chimera is derived from the Greek myth of a fabulous creature which combines elements of a lion, a goat, and a serpent, and thus broke species boundaries to create something new. And on the left, you see this um, creature from mythology. On the right, you see a contemporary jeep, which is a goat sheep chimera, um, which has both hair and wool. It's not a hybrid. This is a fertile animal. The difference in biology between hybrids and chimeras is that chimeras remain fertile, and if they mate with the species that dominates their gametes, they will, in fact, be able to reproduce. Now, obviously, um, in biomedicine, the term that's most frequently encountered is microchimerism, and that means actually less than 1% of the cell's bodies are chimeric. Um, so it's a small but very significant presence of non-self cells coexisting within a dominant population of self cells in the same body. And again, this is the difference between chimeras and hybrids. In hybrids, every single cell in the body is identical um, because you have an assimilation of two different types of DNA. In chimerism, they exist alongside each other. So some cells, for example in the Jeep, would be goat cells, some of them would be sheep cells. So that's microchemerism, but then more extensive chemerism is said to occur where host cells are outnumbered or even replaced, and that can happen within a solid organ, for example. Okay, now it might seem self-evident that the occurrence of chemerism, that's 
at least two sets of DNA and two different tissue types, the HLA system, within a supposedly single body, presents a radical challenge to Western medicine by specifically contesting the definitive principle of the immune system. Yet the authorised discourse of the clinic, and not least the multi-organ transplant unit where I work in Toronto, um, continues to stress the importance of managing immunity. And in a wide yet socio-cultural imaginary, which is um, the biological imaginary both sustains and reflects, so those two are never separate things, the insistence on clear boundaries between self and other continues as yet untroubled and goes on to assure us of our continuing essential singularity. Now, if the undeniable cultural hybridism, solid organ transfer, which obviously stirs up ontological issues for transplant recipients and practitioners alike, isn't most reluctantly acknowledged in the clinic, then the further question of um, cell microchemerism is routinely overlooked. My own contention is that it should be the starting point for a series of reconfigurations. For conventionally, uh, conventionally trained bioscientists who do recognize its existence, the search is for a functional explanation as to why and how what should be a transitory phenomena, better yet it didn't occur at all, may in fact persist for decades. While for me as a critical theorist, the thrill is um, being able to bring philosophical speculation to bear on the problematic that turns eventually to the concept of assemblage in its Deleuzean sense as a better model for organic life, including human life. Now I'm going to come to that later, but first I want to outline some of the developments over the last 60 years since Peter Medivar initially set out his new understanding of the immune system. Um, previously, it had just been focused on countering the pathology of infections. Now, Medivar was um, motivated by the graft rejection, skin grafts, that is, um, experienced by many post-war military personnel. And um, he identified the immune system as effectively destroying potentially palliative non-self tissue. And he suggested a series of ways of securing induced immunotolerance. Now, in its natural state, immunotolerance is a state of non-reactivity towards substances that would normally excite immun immunological response. Now, while several of um, Medivar's observations on immunology have been subsequently superseded, what stuck was the apparently natural antagonism of the self-non-self -self cellular relation. Now, in subsequent decades, the biological imaginary characterized the immune system through a series of militaristic metaphors, we all be very familiar with these, uh, expressing aggression, invasion, foreignness, being met by a swathe of self-defense mechanisms, um, such as natural killer cells. Now, the exploration of this characteristic language of biomedical knowledge production was taken up by many scholars, like Donna Haraway, um, for whom notions of the self Tellingly, uh, tellingly indicate, as she puts it, individuality is a strategic defense problem. Um, in other words, it's a defense problem to maintain those boundaries between the normal self and the pathological other. So other feminist writers like Emily Martin, Lisa Weasel, and more recently Susan Kelly have all commented on the emergence of these discourses. And although the analogies have been frequently undermined by research um, findings that do not fit that antagonistic militaristic model, the very same metaphors do in fact still hold sway in popular culture. Now the problem is while the, while the body's counter to the putative threat of otherness in the form of bacterial infection or perhaps a carcinoma might understandably invoke images of steadfast defense, its hostile reaction to many therapeutic interventions such as tissue and organ transplants or bone marrow um, implants creates biological as well as metaphorical trouble. Moreover, the efficacy and closure of the self and non-self distinction is challenged by the existence of several puzzling anomalies, the most potent of which are the phenomena of autoimmunity where the body's own cells are misrecognized and responded to as other, and the apparently natural tolerance between a pregnant woman and her fetus. 
So what you have in pregnancy are two different HLA, in other words, two different t uh, tissue types. Now, this should evoke an immune response, but it doesn't. Now, with regard to this, it's conventionally inexplicable, given that there are these two systems, that the maternal body should not reject the fetal material or vice versa. But perhaps what should startle us even more um, is that the, the paradox surrounding such a ubiquitous and obviously essential event such as pregnancy has not resulted in any obvious rethinking of the mutually hostile self-other paradigm. The mechanisms of the maternal-fetal relation remain something of a mystery, but the view persists that the two bodies operate as separate entities, immunologically opposed to one another rather than mutually supportive. And although the placenta has been recognised as the site of limited exchange between the mother and fetus, so obviously oxygen's nutrients, um, nutrients and hormones pass in one direction and products of excretia and apopotic placental debris um, in both directions. It was until uh, the late 20th century mainly seen as a protective barrier separating the distinct maternal and um, fetal bodies. At the same time, however, there's been a great deal of research, um, and this is initially associated with the uh, lab of Diane Bianchi, which has uncovered strong evidence that both maternal and fetal cells cross the placental barrier as a matter of course, affecting a form of microchemerism within each body. So these two sets of HLA are exchanging across the placenta. Now, for convenience, um, Y-coded male cells are traced within the maternal body, where they will always be out of place alongside XX cells, while XX cells can be identified within a male fetus. Now the question then becomes, what does it mean for either mother or child to carry within themselves allogenetic antigens? Do they persist post-birth? Are they really tolerated by the host body or simply unrecognized? Are the effects neutral or benign or harmful? Does the aging of maternal cells in the bodies of offspring pose any risks? And you'll notice that each of these questions implicitly refers back to the cell-father distinction. Now, while few bioscientists now doubt the existence of microchemerism, those very small proportions of mismatched HLA in the host body, most see it as transient and insignificant. For others, however, the phenomenon is mired in controversy, particularly in relation to the maternal or fetal, fetal ill health. So microchemerism has been um, identified as both a contributing cause to mysterious autoimmune diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis or MS or lupus, something alien at work after all, and as, an active, as, as active in tissue repair and regeneration, and sometimes in relation to the very same diseases. Now, we're all familiar with the idea that fetal stem cells can rebuild damaged tissue bone or muscle, so there's an immediate sense of recognition in the latter claim of having a beneficial effect, at least with regard to the mother's body. What's confusing is that the evidence that's presented on either side of this debate um, is more or less the same, with only the speculative interpretation um, making, marking the difference in evaluation. The common ground is that non-self cells are frequently found at the site of lesions in greater concentrations than in the peripheral blood supply and in greater concentrations than you would find in so-called healthy bodies. Now, the association here then suggests either a causal link in the disease process, i.e. microchemerism is pathological and generates what appears to be autoimmune disease, or alternatively, that differential HLA, with its distinct immunological signature, gathers at the site of lesions to offer additional protection and re repair in the face of damage. Now, that debate remains mired in binary thinking of either pathology or benefit, um, and it limits the scope of research, and in its own terms, um, there's little sign of it being definitively resolved. Um, most researchers fall back to the position of saying that um, chemerism is sometimes beneficial, sometimes not. And the original hopes when microchemerism was first identified that there would be um, 
therapeutic implications um, has been more or less shelled through lack of funding. Now, if we turn to the field of solid organ transplants, so kidneys, hearts, livers, and so on, the relationship between chimerism and tolerance is a central concern for improving graft acceptance. To forestall the rejection of donor organs, which usually excite a massive immunological response that fully exemplifies the self-other paradigm, the holy grail has long been to induce tolerance. In conventional practice, that tolerance devolves on um, engaging recipients in a usually lifelong regimen of immunosuppressant drugs that allow the donor organ to continue functioning free of either host versus graft disease or graft versus host disease that would both ways lead to rejection. Um, the problem is the immunosuppressant drugs are highly toxic, um, so there are lots of secondary things going on that you really don't want to be there. Now, grafts are very, very rarely close HLA matches, um, which, remember, the HLA is unique to every one of us. But the assumption has been that the alien cellular matter would at least stay in situ, thus localizing the danger, albeit one that could rapidly result in death. In other words, even with close re relations, um, as in kidney transplants, the singular genetic coding of the donor organ will excite an immune response but not one that engages the whole body. Now, very surprisingly, a few very early um, kidney transplant recipients from the 60s survived without extensive immunosuppression. But this wasn't investigated until retrospective studies that were done in the 90s um, by a, a man called Starzl. So he was the first to kind of jolt the accepted doctor. He did systematic reviews that indicated that donor antigens could be found not only in association with the graft site, the kidney, but throughout the recipient body. And other researchers have indicated that cell mobility is bidirectional insofar as the transplant organ itself could show signs of incorporating the recipient's existing HLA. In other words, extensive chemerism was taking place. Now, in Stars' understanding, such chemerism might solve the problem of rejection by keeping in balance the immunogenetic effects of two different populations of cells. And he recommended that recipients should be given pretreatment with stem cells from um, donor bone marrow infused straight into the peripheral blood. I mean, obviously, this only works with live transplants. And that would obviate, obviate, obviate the need for highly toxic programs of immunosuppression. Unfortunately, like many of the other optimistic scenarios, the effect um, wasn't the particularly pr productive as they'd hoped. And again, people fall back on saying, okay, it's because chemerism is transient and it will always be overtaken by a resurgence of chronic rejection. But is chemerism always as ephemeral as the clinical papers of that period suggest. It was seen from most standard research that it is characteristically short-term and mainly limited to the nexus of cellular exchanges that occur during pregnancy. The problem is that having once identified maternal fetal chemerism, very few researchers are actively looking elsewhere for it, but there are some very different results to indicate that in fact chemerism is universal and persistent. Now one of Bianchi's most startling findings was that the pregnancy-generated chemerism could be detected in women many decades after pregnancy, and even in women who had never been pregnant. In other words, Y chromosomes could be found in the peripheral blood and tissues of women who had never conceived, let alone carried a male fetus. Nor had such women any history of uh, blood transfusions or bone marrow or organ transplants. Now, this observation, which has now been confirmed many times over, suggests that chemerism must have additional explanations. One that fits the available cellular profiling is that chemerism could be handed down, as it were, from mother to child, entailing the translocation of HLA derived from a previous pregnancy in which the fetal markers, and remember these are effectively are traced as male, had entered the maternal body. So, in other words, any woman could be carrying Y-coded HLA, not from a pregnancy of her own, but from the circulation of an older male sibling cells in her mother's body. But if, as many bioscientists believe, chemerism is potentially lifelong in duration, 
and one can surmise an intergenerational scenario in which each one of us, regardless of pregnancy status, could carry non-self cells from a variety of genetic relations. And the so-called grandmother hypothesis um, and the, the concept of tertiary chemerism begin to um, capture this. It's the idea it just gets carried down from generation. It might have been your grandmother who was pregnant with a male fetus or further back. But does this go far enough? I mean, in, in principle, it's difficult to see why chemerism, if indeed it can be detected at all ages, should not persist and therefore be transmitted indefinitely. Now, it's telling that although there is a similar suggestion in Lee Nelson's quasi-journalistic article, it's called Your Cells and My Cells, which was in the um, popular journal Scientific America, there is not a hint of this intergenerational chemerism in her extensive lab work. She runs one of the biggest labs working on chemerism, so she writes journalistic articles called Your Cells and My Cells, but she never does it in biomedical journals. So even at her, her most sympathetic interviews and articles, Nelson still implicitly holds on to a self-other model of distinct identities. And she names, and this is in Scientific America, she names chimeric cells as stowaways, migrants, adopted emigres, seeds that take root, interlopers, masqueraders, and so on. In other words, still matter out of place. So biomedical science is quite clearly not yet ready for a really radical challenge to one of its fundamental beliefs. Now, in fact, chimerism is already known to be ubiquitous in both diseased and healthy bodies, relating not only to um, pregnancy and transgenerational genetic transfer, but to non-irradiated um, blood transfusions, bone marrow implants, and all types of tissue and organ transplantation and human dizygotic fusion. But why should we stop there? Although the idea at present is untested, it's been suggested that lactation, and fluid sexual exchanges could equally generate microchemerism, which further raises the question of the implausibility of genetic inviolability. Now, if each body in the course of normal health carries plural and durable populations of active HLA, it's clearly not just our understanding of the immune system that needs to be resought. The very existence of chemerism and the probability that it is ubiquitous deeply disorders any notion of bounded self or of individuality, while paradoxically reinforcing the trope of uniqueness. In other words, the more diverse gene sets you carry, the more matchless you become. So it's a very interesting paradox between the loss of individuality and the actual um, exaggeration, if you like, of uniqueness. So let's now explore how the empirical observations that I've been outlining imbricate with a posthumanist critique of the bound itself. And it's worth remembering that the notion of immunity as defense of the body only emerged in biomedicine in the late 19th century, after many hundreds of years in which it was purely a juridical and political concept. Now my starting point is with a dissection of the word immunity undertaken by the philosopher Roberto Esposito who sees it as intertwined with what at first glance might seem to be an opposing concept, that of community. Uh, we are. Now, where the latter, community, refers to something public and held in common, immunity signifies that which is private and particular to myself. But as, as Posito points out, the two terms have in common a root in the Latin word munos, which means an obligation or a gift. Now, munus is all about obligations and the responsiveness to the other, if you like, about reciprocity. And it's what oils the wheels of community and what is rejected by immunity. The one who is immune is exonerated from reciprocal gift giving and stands as an autonomous individual, free from the abnegation of self that community demands. Now, this is highly familiar in my research around heart transplantation, where the acceptance of the donor organ, which is nearly always called the gift of life, um, and which you'll remember is currently reliant on the lifelong suppression of the recipient's immune system, inaugurates an enduring obligation within the recipient. Among the many troubling issues faced by heart recipients as they attempt to restore the texture of their prior lives, 
is that, sorry, I've just lost my place. Oh yeah. Is that the new reality of what would be called hybrid lives gives rise to the ontological question, who am I now? So you're carrying a donor organ with a completely different HLA. And an equally confusing sense of kinship with the donor family often follows transplant. Now, a very high proportion of donees experience considerable psychic disturbance, regardless of the medical success of the procedure and the prospect of increased life expectancy. Now, commenting on Esposito's work, Timothy Campbell writes, accepting the munos directly undermines the capacity of the individual to identify himself or herself as such and not part of the community. And that's precisely the issue with recipients the majority of whom have um, previously and unproblematically understood themselves within normative paradigms of Western modernism as autonomous selves, sovereign individuals with a very clear sense of the corporeal distinctions between oneself and the other. Now, as Esposito notes, it's logically unthinkable for classical culture to tolerate the two-in-one or the one that is made to. So as a result, organ transplantation in which the differential DNA of the donor material is never assimilated as such, but remains fundamentally other, offers a somewhat paradoxical take on the preservation of the individual life. Um, recipients are always told they're going to return to who they were before they got ill. Now, the move to bring together the seemingly disparate areas of political philosophy and the body is at the very heart of biopolitics. And it's worth remembering that biological terminology both emerges as a symptom of political cultural discourse and is generative of that discourse. So the embodied self is always a point of biopolitical production. And as such, any cellular nomadism across the supposedly impermeable borders of distinct human organisms challenges the concept of immunity at all levels. Now, the underlying model for Esposito's biopolitics is, of course, biomedical. So when he says the immune is, quote, the non-being and the not having anything in common, he directly recalls the scientific definition based on the self-non-self -self, self um, discrimination, where immunity is both protective against the destruction of the individual and at risk of over-identifying otherness to the point of destroying precisely what would be life-saving. And this is exactly the point driving the conventional management of the body's immune response in chronic rejection towards donor organ or tissue. Unlike lifelong immunosuppression that's imposed on the recipient, um, sorry, unless um, lifelong immunosuppression is imposed on the recipient, both the incoming material, the new organ, and the host body, which is wholly dependent on the replacement, will die. As Esposito notes, immunity which is necessary for protecting our lives, if carried past a certain threshold, winds up negating it. Now, in Esposito's terms, that leads to a form of thanatopolitics, which I'm not going to trace here. And like Derrida, Esposito sees autoimmunity as the characteristic mode of contemporary politics, the inevitable outcome of the same process where the negative protection of life strengthens so much that it is reversed into its own opposite, will end up destroying not only the enemy outside it, but also its own body. Um, I'm not going to speak very much about autoimmunity because I notice that's what Kerry's workshop is going to be about, and those of you who go to that workshop will be very bored with it afterwards. So I'm leaving that bit to Kerry. Okay, so um, what's rejected in the overdetermined immunity against putative risk, and this is both in politics and biology, is the possibility of productive reconfiguration that goes beyond the oppositional mode of self and other. So, as Esposito writes, the only way for death to sorry, life to defer death isn't to preserve it as such, perhaps in the immunitary form of negative protection, but rather to be reborn continually in different guises. Now, what he clearly understands is that biomedical technologies and indeed political practices entail both the technological and ontological transmutation of the human body. 
And while he mentions transplantation only in passing, Esposito does refer to pregnancy as the model for an immunity that does not end up destroying the life that it seeks to preserve, that is not simply tolerant, but hospitable to and nourishing of difference. And as I mentioned earlier, there is growing acceptance that HLA chimerism activated by pregnancy is bidirectional and at very least partially protective to both the mother and the fetus and then of course the subsequent child. And this surely calls to mind the kind of reciprocal and embodied ethics that's been developed by the feminist philosopher Ros Dipros. She uses the term corporeal generosity to evoke an unacknowledged form of community in which the self is not so much jeopardised by risky contacts with the common, as Esposito would put it, but engaged in a mode of giving and receiving that is not dependent on the reduction, of same, reduction to sameness that's implied by exchange. Corporeal generosity for Diprose can only emerge precisely in the event of difference, which must be both protected and responded to. She writes, intercorporeal generosity maintains alterity and ambiguity in the possibilities it opens. Generosity is only possible if neither sameness nor unity is assumed as either the basis or the goal of an encounter with another. Now, Dipro sees all life as dependent on an indeterminate range of openings to the other and on a fluid array of connections that undermine the notion of an atomistic self. So, in effect, both the isolation of immunitas, the refusal of gifting, and the embrace of communitas, the coming together of generosity, pose a risk to the integrity of bodies, but only if we understand integrity as the completion and closure of individual bodies. The contemporary bodies of sociocultural politics and bioscience alike have lost their singularity, and what Diprose's model of corporeal generosity offers is yet another challenge to the viability of the stubbornly entrenched biomedical and clinical narrative of a static and autonomous self. Now, there's no mention of chimerism in Diprose's account, but in related work, Myra Hurd extends Diprose's notion of the effective material offering of our body to the other to the specific relations of maternity. She suggests that alongside the transfer of DNA, there are a variety of other materials in transit, um, viruses, antibodies, nutrients, bacteria, biochemical substances, and cellular material that go between the maternal and fetal body, all of which could be seen as instances of corporeal generosity. Um, she doesn't explore the notion that microchemerism in pregnancy is bidirectional. She sees, she sees this just really happening in, in one direction. But she's insistent that all such embodied gift giving is unpredictable and potentially disturbing. And she references Haraway's view of the subsequent child, and this is a quote, I love this one, as a randomly associated genetic package. What matters here is neither, that neither corporeal generosity nor chimerism are instances of assimilation, where a new singular form materialises. Instead, bodies and microparts of bodies are conjoined in their irreducible differences. So just as a jeep is a true chimera um, capable of reproducing either a lamb or a kid, the critical point of this strange form of communitas is that it overrides the immunological discourse of self and other without transcending what Deleuze would call difference in itself. Now, with that in mind, I'm, I'm not going to pursue any further the implications of Esposito's own wider reflections in biopolitics, except to note that although he has much in common with Derrida, whose understanding of the gift and of an absolute hospitality is highly relevant here, Esposito opens up the field even further with some gestures towards Deleuze. In making the technological and ontological transmutation of the body, sorry, marking the ontological and trans, uh, technological transmutation of the body, Esposito leaves behind the biomedical trope of tolerance, which in immunological terms refers to a lack of reaction to the other, a kind of passive coexistence. And he posits the logic of dynamic multiplicity, where variation is mutually effective. As he puts it, we need to find the mode, the forms, the conceptual language 
for converting the immunitary declension into a singular and plural logic in which the differences become precisely that which keep the world united. Now Derrida's notion of hospitality certainly does some of that work in establishing the fundamental interiority of otherness, but I'm not sure that it can offer up the affirmative biopolitics that Esposito is seeking. What Esposito wants is a way of thinking fresh and constructing more adequate concepts about the events that evolve and transform us, which he claims is precisely what Deleuze sees as the primary purpose of philosophy. So in appealing to the impersonal as the only vital mode that goes beyond conventional semantics that continue to function in relation to the individuality of the person, Deleuze gives recognition to the one in the other and the unbounded potentiality of life's becoming. So I'm going to end then with some pre preliminary speculations on where a Deleuzean approach might take us in finally exploding the mythology of self-other distinctions and engaging with wholesale chimerism. The radical break made possible by Deleuze not only contests the boundaries of embodiment, um, it's Okay. It also makes sense and to a degree settles, and it, it's never really settled, of course, many of the troubling aspects of the question, who am I? Which is the fundamental question in both transparent, uh, in transplantation and in pregnancy. The fundamental shift is from the conventional paradigm of self versus other in the formulation that still dominates immunology and biomedical science more, more generally to the view of the normal self as constitutively chimeric. And that in turn transgresses both spatial and temporal dimensions insofar as neither the self nor the body have a singular location. Now at the heart of Deleuze's philosophy, as you know, is the decisive break with the notion of an atomistic subject that celebrates not static being, but a state of becoming in which every individual subject is caught up in a process of unraveling. So each of us enters into multiple and unpredictable webs of connection, what Deleuze calls assemblages, in which life itself is characterized as a non-personal vitalist force that exceeds the unique temporality and experiences and composition of each individual. Now this idea of assemblage is highly effective in understanding what's at stake in chim chimerism, which is never about assimilation that wipes out differences but about a coming together of disparate elements that deform and reform each other, yet go on functioning in a new configuration. Now, in the ongoing research, um, transplantation research, I've been thinking about organ transplantation in terms of parasitism, which you know, equally is a form of chimerism. But it, it's uneasy because it still maintains that self-other antagonism as part of the concept. Now, a Deleuzean mode, in contrast, stresses that life is marked by the generative power of connection and transformation. And such an approach is highly apposite for our technologized society and may be particularly useful in rethinking organ transplantation as an ongoing project, not only for the recipient, but for the donor too. And it entails a move from the strategic defense of the self, marked as immunity, to what Esposito might call community. In Deleuzean terms, life is not a discrete essence actualized in the individual body, but simply an element in a wider cycle of becoming that encompasses all manner of beings, organisms, and machines. So each human life force is clearly marked by discrete events like pregnancy or transplantation where things change and reform. But in another sense, events are also incorporeal and atemporal forces and intensities that are excessive to any given form of embodiment. So how could this open up new ways of understanding the chimerism which so troubles conventionally ex the conventional exclusionary function of the immune system? In liberal humanist context uh, in which only individual identity counts, it's reasonable in the case of transplantation that recipients should wish to be restored to the person who preceded the surgery. But in Deleuzean terms, individual ownership of life gives way to the intensity of continued becoming in a process with neither beginning nor end. And you'll remember my earlier speculation about intergenerational chimerism. So in that sense, elements of the donor 
coexist with the recipient in a new assemblage that contributes to the ongoing flux and flow of life. Now, post-mortem donation is already strongly Deleuzean insofar as each deceased donor body provides on average um, seven organs and tissues um, for quite separate recipients, which clearly indicates the cross-cutting power of connectivity and assemblage that supersedes the individual death. So this one dead body is going to be spread over at least seven other bodies. Now, for Deleuze, the point would, be not, would not be about restored functional efficacy for the recipient, but what Bradotti calls sustainability, the very possibility of future, of duration and of continuity. The relation between recipient and donor in such a model is not one of self and other, but an impersonal coming together in a new and unpredictable assemblage that reflects the actual chimerism that has taken place. So alongside the anticipated changes that occur as a result of transplantation, the unpredictable transmutations of chemerism, which can be perceived as both positive and negative, disorder existing material boundaries and temporal limits and move towards new possibilities of becoming other than the conventional human self. Now, as an authoritative discourse, or authoritative discourses, both biomedicine and political um, philosophy continue to promote a concept of unity that speaks to the modernist desire to protect the illusion, illusory purity of the defended self. And in Esposito's terms, it undermines the development of positive community. Yet in accessing the basic science research on gestational um, chemerism and its intergenerational implications, all the chimeric aspects of organ and tissue transplantation, and that would include newly emerging st uh, stem cell transplants for neurological disorders. It's increasingly clear that the biological ground of the mutually reinforcing biopolitical trope of immunity as the underpinning of distinct identities is far from certain. Now at the cellular level, the intermingling of corporeal materials and I'd like to stress again that that includes not just human-human chemerism, but many other forms, but also the whole nexus of the microbiome. That intermingling maintains the notion of irreducible difference and goes way beyond the metaphor of hybridity. And it suggests a transgressive form of kinship, not only across difference, but also across the life-death boundary, where the teleological structures of modernity are most at stake. Now, if chemerism is the rule rather than the exception, it inevitably undoes the illusion of separation and distinction and suggests post-humanist ways of thinking existence, not in terms of self-defense nor in terms of a limited life course, but through an atemporal dynamic of coexistence in the inherently communal form of assemblage. So thought together, chemerism and an immunopolitics do not yet speak directly to the post-human, but by intensifying the post-human insistence on the internal diversity, permeability, and intersection of all bodies, the further implications are there for us to explore. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret, so much for a really extremely rich presentation. Um, I'm sure we have plenty of questions. We can definitely dip into our closing remarks time to explore.
Ja. Mm -hmm. It has to catalyst another form of sustainment mindfully in the environment of those parts of the cycle to co create another form of sustainment. I, I think I need to begin answering you before you, you add any more. Okay, um, in, in terms of um, what I'm trying to do here, the reason I stress the difference between hybrids and chimeras is precisely that chimeras, is precisely that chimeras are internally both self and other, or self and others, in fact. I mean, it's never just one other. Whereas a hybrid has assimilated differential DNA and remains completely um, identical. All the cells in the body of the hybrid are exactly the same. The cells in the body of Chimera are completely different. Now, putting that into a, a biopolitical and, as you say, ethical context. Now, of course, we could have an ethics um, of recognition of differences, which is what you suggested, but that would still, or could still, within a modernist context, maintain the separation of self and other. So we could go on being bounded bodies, but we could just have a different way of um, conducting our ethics, and a lot of feminist ethics has presen precisely been around that notion of um, recognition and responsibility to the other, where the other does remain other. So that would be one form of maintaining difference, but it also maintains the, the boundaries between self and other. And what I'm suggesting about breaking down in chimerism is that it's, it's a visceral um, process of, I mean, obviously I'm talking biomedically at the cellular level, where in fact what's going on is the cohabitation, the coexistence within a single body of all those differences. And, you know, I, I would want to stress that chimerism isn't just two sets of DNA, it can be multiple sets of DNA. Um, the microbiome itself, of course, tells us that we are, I think it's something like 95% non-human cells. So, you know, that's the kind of breakdown I'm looking for, and that's the kind of breakdown, I think, that fundamentally undermines any kind of um, revision of ethics within a modernist framework of separate bounded bodies, and that's what I'm trying to get to with the diversity and assemblage. Well, it's impossible. Uh, you know, Stuart Butler wrote about grammar in the early 1990s. You cannot get outside that language. So, of course, you're trapped. Um, I think, you know, we, we, we're, we're trying to explore 
um, new ideas and new ways of thinking, and we haven't, we haven't invented, if you like, a practical way of getting beyond that kind of binary structure in which knowledge is already organized and language is already organized. Um, I think we can only be pointing out the limitations. Um, I mean, I think it's very interesting listening, for example, to um, the presentation that Geoffrey did, that poetics seems to be one of the ways that you can begin to break down language in, in a productive way. Um, unfortunately, I can't write like that. Um, and maybe you can't either. But maybe those kind of ways are, we'll be seeing much more of in academic scholarship. I hope so. I mean, I, I think I would give a similar answer as I, I just said. You know, we, we are caught up in those kind of um, structures of expression and communication. And some of us are able to write past that. And if you're not, the most you can do is always be pointing it out. So, you know, there is a kind of self-reflexivity about how you would actually need to communicate that whilst putting the provisos in at the same time. Um, I think when I talk about chimerism and I talk, um, I mean, I publish both in strictly biomedical journals and in um, humanities journals, so I have a dual way of writing. In the biomedical journals, don't even think about being clever with words. <laughs> you know, it's completely straightforward, um, else it doesn't get published at all. Um, and in order to even talk about some of the ideas um, around things like parasitism or chimerism, you have to be as simple as possible. Um, there has to be no grounds for ambiguity. Well, of course, as the humanities scholars, and particularly as post-structuralist humanities scholars, um, you know, we think ambiguity is absolutely essential and fundamental to the way in which we express ourselves. Um, so I'm always shifting between one and the other. Um, but I, I would agree, you never arrive at an ideal place. You, you, you simply, if you like, have some kind of aspirational direction to be moving in, and that's about as far as it goes at the moment. But there, there will never be an adequate language. Um, you know, language itself is so dynamic. There will never be the moment that you have the expression that you need. Um, I, I, I think in terms of the way in which most of us, um, at least at this conference, would be using the term hybrid is in its cultural metaphorical sense. So, you know, those of you who are writing about hybrids, you may actually be writing about chimeras, um, although you don't necessarily know it. Um, I think if one takes the biological definition of hybrid, it is a bit of a dead end because it imposes sameness in, in a very, very... Um, absolute way 
the actual definition of a hybrid is that all the cells of the body are identical. So there's no question of a disruption of what it means to be a bounded body. But as you say, you know, it's a different kind of bounded body, but it creates the hybrid, non-hybrid binary. Um, so it's, it's, it's not particularly useful in itself. And I, I use, I, in my own work, I do use the, the metaphor of hybridity. Um, but I think in technical terms, it's not the way forward. Whereas I think chemerism is offering us something very, very different which is the coexistence of multiple um, HLA DNA sets within single bodies forming conglomerations. And I've been very interested to think about the viscerality of this. Um, when, when one is um, reading Deleuze, most people will think about assemblages as the coming together of external processes, for example, with a human body in various ways and everything, the complications that go with that. But I wanted to think about it in terms of internal processes. So to me, the very um, existence of multiple sets of 